right, are you ready? How many of you have heard Pastor Brian before? Now your church better say yes. All right. Who has not heard Pastor Brian before? All right, we got some. Oh, this is going to be fun. Pastor Brian and Natasha are, are dear friends, and, I, you know, we don't say that cliche. Uh, we met them uh, through Brother Tracy Harris, uh, and uh, we got connected in the Spirit, and uh, we had him come, I think this is the third time, amen? And uh, I just knew that this was something that we needed to do on a regular basis, and uh, uh, I think Brian always has a, Brian and I, you can just tell that we, we, we're cut from the same cloth. Amen? Amen. And he, he preaches faith, and I love preaching faith. Amen. So it is my honor, my pleasure to introduce Pastor Brian Young, Word Power Church, League City, Texas. Look, give me a water right there. Amen. Let's stretch your hands towards him. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna drain him tonight. Amen? Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, you love this man. I love this man. And Lord, there are things in him that he has specifically for tonight for this congregation. So Lord, I just thank you right now that there's a freedom in the Spirit I thank you that even right now in his spirit, Father, that he's arranging and ordering and lining up, Father, word upon word, line upon line, precept upon precept. But Father, by faith right now, we receive everything that he has for West Houston Christian Center. And Lord, I just speak that his church is going to be blessed because of the seed that he's sowing tonight. We thank you, Lord, for growth, for increase, Father, for influence. I just keep seeing influence. You can't get around these people without vision. Lord, there's just vision all over them. So, Father, we receive it, and we call it done in Jesus' mighty name. Amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. There's power. <laughs> Amen. All right. Now, I think I'm going to start up here and end up down there. Okay? Is that all right? Man, I feel tall up here. <laughs> goodness. Yes. That's why I like coming to preach here. You know, my pulpit is on the ground. I come up here. I, I can look down on them, everybody. <laughs> Amen. Well, it's always an honor to come here and to minister, and I just feel like I'm at home. Amen. And so I want you to relax. Uh, we're going to have a good time tonight. I'm not going to be long. I have my stopwatch. He who is short-winded is invited back. Amen. And so I also want to agree with you, Pastor Jack, uh, on that prayer, the prophetic word you just spoke out. I believe in debt free Christmases Amen. all over this place right now. In Jesus name, supernatural surprises are coming your way. Amen. Just begin to expect it. Just begin to expect it. Don't try to make it happen. Just expect it to happen. Amen. I love what um, one person I heard say expectation that cannot be killed cannot be denied. Amen. And so if you can't kill your expectation, if no one can kill your expectation, it will not be denied. You're going to receive exactly what you came for. Amen? Amen. I want to do something real quickly. Uh, pause my clock. I want to call up my beautiful wife. I want y'all to see my Proverbs 31 woman. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Pastor Natasha Young, she makes me, she makes me preach well. And she makes, me, she makes me look good. Amen. Do we have a microphone? Just. Amen. Hallelujah. Just kind of. Pastor just said that I make you tall. Amen. <laughs> I'm married above myself. Amen. 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 It's an honor. I'm married above myself. Amen. Amen. Don't make Amen. me blush. <laughs> You know, uh, when you started talking about the gift, mm. you know, Jesus is a gift. And a lot of times we receive Jesus in package form. Mm -hmm. Y'all ever seen what a kid does when they open up their gifts? You know, you go through all this trouble to buy something real expensive and real nice for your children, right? But a baby doesn't get hung up on what's inside the package. Yeah. 
They love the package. They just like the package. Amen. And, you know, Jesus is the gift that we receive every Christmas. Yeah. Why do we go out and spend more money than we have to give to people who don't care anyway? Mm-hmm. Why do we do that? Let's not do that this year. You know? Let's do something different. Let's uh, live within our means. Mm. Uh, not try to give beyond our means. Amen. But, but give a reasonable gift uh, that we can afford. Amen? Uh, come out of Christmas not being in debt this year. Yeah, come on. And, you know, why don't we open the package this year? I'm talking about Jesus. Amen. Let's just not receive the name Jesus and say, okay, I got my Christian tag on. I worship Jesus. Why don't we jump inside? Yeah, amen. Yeah. Jump inside the box. Amen. And figure out all the treasures that's inside, that's that. inside that box this year. You see, I think sometimes we lose focus. Amen. And I think this year we need to do like babies. And instead of focusing on all this other stuff, let's just jump in the box. Amen. I'm talking about breaking that word open. I I love what you said. Let's just get out of the four walls Mm. and go to where the people are. You know, nobody really understood Jesus. Because Jesus didn't stay within the temple. That's now, right. he was regularly seen in the temple, which means that whenever the church doors were open, he was there. Yeah. But as soon as he could get out to the people, he ministered to them. Amen. And at his time, during his day, nobody liked the tax man. Nobody liked the rich man. Nobody liked certain people in society. And you know what Jesus would do? He would seek them out. Yeah. Come on. And he would minister to them. You see, you need to go to the people who want to hide from you because they think that you don't like them. Mm. That's good. That's good. We need to open the package, jump into who he is. And guess what? He'll jump into who you are. Amen. Listen, how many people in here can honestly say Jesus has totally and radically changed your life? Amen. Amen. Glory to God. And now it's time for people to know who he is, and they'll only get to know him through you. you. So I just applaud this church for going yeah. outside of the yeah. four walls. That is amazing. That's good. Amen. Amen. That same spirit get off on us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Y'all give my wife a hand clap. Amen. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this, another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, for revelation, knowledge flowing freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. Thank you, Lord, that you speak through my vocal cords, think through my mind, that my speech and preaching is not with enticing words as in men's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and power. And faith may not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Thank you, Lord. Your people are anointed today to receive revelation. It's in Jesus' name we pray and let everyone say amen. 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 Praise God. Well, let's get right into it. I have a a word in my spirit. Uh, Before I came here, I began to pray about what we was going to minister on today. Every time I come here, I always want to come here with a word. I mean, I don't want to even go to any place to preach my own church without a word from the Lord. You know, I don't want to just give you a half-baked meal. I want to give you something from from heaven. And so as I begin to just pray about certain things, you know how it is when you are, you know, writing a letter and you, you, you crumple that letter up and throw it away and you write another letter, you crumple that up and throw it away and you write another letter. So, you know, I had all these different messages in my mind. It's kind of like changing my clothes seven times, you know. And, um, but I, uh, this morning, my wife and I, we were teaching on our six o'clock program on gratitude and being thankful. And so it just went off in me. And uh, the Lord said, teach on that today. So we're going to teach on radical gratitude tonight. Amen. Amen? And how gratitude can absolutely release supernatural power in your life. Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we're going to look at verse 18. And uh, as you turn there, I want to begin to define the word gratitude. What does the word gratitude mean? Now, the Webster's Dictionary of 1828, I like that dictionary, because what he did is he began to take Bible words and he would define them. So I really like the, that dictionary. Um, but it says gratitude is an emotion of the heart. It's an emotion of, a, of the heart excited by a favor or a benefit received. So I can have gratitude when something has given to me. I can have gratitude when I've received a benefit. You know, of, of course, whenever you receive something from a, a gift, like my wife was talking about, you receive a present, what do you do? You say, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, you're supposed to say thank you. <laughs> you know, my parents was one of those kind of parents where, where they would, did you, did, you, did you tell them thank you? Yes, ma'am, I told them thank you. Well, of course you are grateful when you receive a gift, but now listen to this other definition of gratitude. It's a sentiment of kindness or goodwill towards a benefactor. In other words, um, I can show you kindness or goodwill because of what you have done for me. Amen. Or the fact that you have been a benefit in my life. Now, this to me means that I can be thankful even before I receive the benefit. Now, uh, one of the things my daughters and I like to do, and my, my, my family and, and, and I, what we like to do is we like to go out to eat. Now, we don't go out to eat a whole lot anymore because uh, we, we went to Africa and we just found out you can do a lot more with less. But uh, there are times when the girls will say, hey, are we going to eat at this place called Kura? Does anybody know what Kura is? Sushi? Anybody eat sushi? I'm just, just, just me. Okay, so uh, we go eat at this place called Kura. Well, they will ask the question, hey, are we going to eat there? We will say yes. Now, before they have their first bite of sushi, before we enter into the restaurant, they're already thanking us. Why? Because of the expectation of what they are going to receive. Amen. See, we can be thankful because God has already promised us that we're healed. We can be thankful because God has already promised us that we have the blessing. We can be thankful because God has already promised us we're going to have a debt-free Christmas. So instead of us just sitting there and saying, amen, debt-free Christmas, praise the Lord, we can start thanking him now because we know it's going to be, it's going to be a done deal. It's going to come to pass. Amen. amen? amen. And so now it, it says that being grateful is the have this kindness towards a benefactor or someone that's going to provide. You know it's already provided, so you can be thankful for, before you even see it. Amen. Amen. Now, this word gratitude is also simply this thankfulness, just being thankful. Amen? Amen. Now, when I think about radical gratitude... Radical gratitude is not general thankfulness. Like being thankful for my house, or being thankful for my dog, or being thankful for sweet potato pie, or pumpkin pie. But when I think of radical gratitude, you have to look at what it says over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now look at that real quickly. I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation, but it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 18. It says this, be thankful, be thankful, have gratitude, have a praise in your heart, or have this excited emotion of heart towards someone who has totally become a benefit in your life. Amen. In other words, I should find something to be thankful for. Amen. Pastor Jack just said it. There's something that we can be thankful for. There's something that you can wake up every morning and say, thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you that I have eyes to see. Lord, I thank you I have ears to hear. Lord, I thank you that I have legs that I may walk on. Just find something to be thankful about. 
So it says, be thankful. Now, another word for this word thankful is the word Eucharist. Now, does anyone know what Eucharist means? It means having communion, take communion. Do you know when you take communion, it's not just a religious thing. When you take communion, you are giving God thanks. Now, what did he say? As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. In other words, I take communion remembering what he's already done for me. See, his death brought a separation. I was separated from sickness and disease. I was separated from poverty and lack. I was separated from sin and and, and on my way to hell. I was separated from it. I was, I was separated from it at his finished works on the cross. And when I take communion, it reminds me to be thankful for what he's already done for me. Lord, I may be sick in my body right now, but I'm going to take communion because giving thanks during a time of communion, I know will bring or manifest my healing. Giving thanks during a time of communion will remind me that I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Giving thanks at the time of communion will remind me I'm already prosperous and I'm not trying to go somewhere to work and toil or get some things. I am already this way and communion reminds me to give God thanks to do that. So it says, be thankful. Now it, it goes on to say, in all circumstances. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. So a thankful person is the mark of a believer. How do we know that you are a believer? Not because you wear a T-shirt and not because you come to come to church here. How do I know that you're a believer? I know that you're a believer that when all of us are in a circumstance, you're the one praising. All of us are going through something and you're the one giving God thanks. All of us are in a situation, but you're the one with your hands raised. So you have to understand that the mark of a believer is a thankful person. Now, we said this this morning, God didn't call you to be a thermometer. A thermometer is moved and changed by the circumstance. God called you to be a thermostat. Now, what does a thermostat do? A thermostat is a change agent. So when I go to a circumstance, when I go to a situation, I'm not going to let that situation bring me down. I'm going to change the situation through my praise. I'm going to change the situation through my Being thankful. Don't shout me down just because I'm preaching real good. I mean, I know it's cold outside, but you got to understand. See, you can't allow the the circumstance to bring you down. God has put you here not to become dark. He put you here to be the light, come on, in the midst of darkness. It shouldn't be more turmoil when you arrive. It shouldn't be more death and sickness when you arrive. It shouldn't be more strife when you arrive. When you arrive, you come and you bring the light. When you arrive, you come and you bring the healing. When you arrive, you come and you bring the blessing. So if everybody losing their job, you don't get in there and start crying with everybody. Say, I will probably lose my job too. No, you say, come on, let's all grab hands. Listen, we're going to believe God. Everybody in here is going to keep their job in the name of Jesus. Why? We're change agents. You are the answer to the world's problem. Hallelujah. So it says, in all circumstances, give thanks, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Now, notice it said, give thanks in all circumstances. It didn't say give thanks for all circumstances. So we don't give thanks for the problems. We don't give thanks for the bad in our lives. We don't give thanks for the evil in the world. We don't give thanks for the 
you know, the car wreck. But you can give thanks in it. See, there are some things that you got to understand. I'm going to come down here. I'm already down here now. There's some things you have to understand. That when Moses was faced with a Red Sea circumstance, what did God tell him? He said, why are you crying to me? Why are you up here bellyaching about your circumstance? He said, what do you have in your hand? He had a staff. He had a scepter of righteousness. He says, hold the staff up. Remind yourself of who you are. Remind yourself that you have a covenant with God Almighty. Remind yourself that once you stick up this righteousness, I will automatically move in your life. So there's some circumstances like the Red Sea that's so high you can't go over it. There's some circumstances like the Red Sea that's so low you can't go under. There's some circumstances like the Red Sea that's so wide you can't go around it. So what must you do? Go through it. And how do I go through? I go through with praise. I go through with thanksgiving. I go through praising God all the way while I'm walking. And as I'm praising God, now supernatural circumstance, supernatural power is being released on my life. Because the moment he lifted that hand, come on church, the supernatural happened. There are some enemies in your life that's trying to imitate you. But let me tell you something. You're going to be often imitated but never duplicated. In other words, in other words, people think they got you over a barrel because you're going through some things right now. They don't know how much power you possess. And what you're going to show them is that the moment you go through, you're going to be praising. And they're going to try to go through that same Red Sea. And you know what happened to Pharaoh? Pharaoh got swallowed up in the Red Sea. So that means every debt, every problem, every circumstance in your way is about to be swallowed up in the Red Sea. So be thankful in and not for. Be thankful what? In. And not four. Now, okay, I'm a pastor, so I'm gonna put on my pastor hat right now because I want to teach you some things. Pastor, I don't understand why we go through what we go through. If God is in control, why do we go through what we go through? Am I at the right church tonight? So let's ask, let's ask that question. Is God in control? Now before you answer, let's, let's, let's prove whether or not God is in control. Amen? Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Because I'm supposed to give thanks in all circumstances. Right. Okay. So is God in control? Genesis 1.26. Let's, let's read it out of the, I think I'm in the New King James in this Bible. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion. dominion. Let them have what? Dominion. Now, if you don't know what dominion is, let me break it down. Dominion is sovereign or supreme authority. Sovereign or supreme authority. Another word for dominion is the right to command. So when God says, let them have dominion, he also said, let them have authority. He also said, let them have the right to command. Watch this. Or he says, let them have the right or the authority. And they are to make use of the power. 
that God has supplied. So God has given you the power, but he's also given you the power to use the power that he supplied. Now, understand this. When you, who, who is your lighting company here? Who's your electrical company here? TXU? Okay. So TXU supplies electricity to this building. Okay. Is, is it Centerpoint or, or Texas, New Mexico power or whatever? Okay. So they supply the power to this building. But now they will not come to this building and start flipping on lights for you. Amen? So where they have left off, it is now in your power to take control. They supplied the power, but now it's up to you what rooms get the power. So they, they won't come in here. They won't say, Pastor Jack, you need to turn on the lights in the kids' room. You need to turn on the lights in the, in the sanctuary. No, they're not going to do anything. They say, I've supplied the power. Now it's up to you what you do with it. Come on. Come on. I'm going somewhere with this. So God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have the ability to use the power that I supplied. I've given them the power. But now I'm not going to come down here and start Fixing stuff. In other words, he's given us an ability to, to take anything that's out of order and put it back in order. There you go. Amen. Mm. Amen. Then he says, over the fish of the sea, you have a th- dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over all the earth, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So you have authority over the creeps. So verse 27, so God created man in his what? Own image, in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Verse 28, and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and watch this word, subdue it. That means to conquer by force or the exertion of superior power or bring it into subjection. So you now, let's see. Give me a uh, brother, uh, Mitch. Give me my keys. So, so God has given man dominion and authority. Now, man was not the originator of the earth. In other words, man did not create the earth. But man was given the keys to run the earth. Right. Come on. Amen. For instance, center point, I'm not center point, whoever built your house, They are the creators of your house. But now once they turn the authority over to you, they don't have the right to open open your door and walk in your house. Amen? So what God has done, God has taken the keys of his authority, his power, his ability, his dominion, and he's put it in the hands of the man. And he's not going to, by law, since God is a spirit, he gave a power and authority and dominion to a, to a spirit in a physical flesh and bone body, blood body. He give, he's given you the authority. Now, by law, he as a spirit cannot come into your domain and start changing things. Are we all on the same page? Y'all checking with me? So now, who all of a sudden has authority in the earth? I didn't hear everybody. Who has authority in the earth? So now, who's in control? Mankind. Think about this. Abraham was God's license to come into the earth and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Notice God says, shall I hide from Abraham that which I'm about to do, seeing that he's going to show it to his, his generations? In other words, God says, I can't even destroy Sodom and Gomorrah until Abraham gives me the license to do it. Why? He turned the authority over to mankind. That's so good. That's good. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. All right. Let's keep on with the... Thank you, brother. Y'all give Wyatt Earp a great big hand clap. Amen. Amen. All right, let's look at another scripture now. Let's go to Luke chapter 4. We're going somewhere with this. We're talking about gratitude. Luke chapter 4. Then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit, verse 1, Luke 4 and 1. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, watch this. Command, command these stones to be turned to bread. See, if you have all of this authority and power, then why are you going through what you're going through, Jesus? If you have all this authority and power, why are you struggling from paycheck to paycheck? If you have all this authority and power, why are you constantly in the dilemma that you find yourself in? He said, prove that you have power. Prove that you are an authority. And notice Jesus didn't have to give in to the devil. What did he do? He rested on the word. He said, it is written. See, whenever the devil comes to your, your house and starts knocking on your door and trying to get you to prove something that goes outside of the confines of God's word, you say, no, it is written. It is written. It is written. Amen. Now, let's keep going. Verse 5. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment time. And the devil said, all this authority I will give you and their glory. For this has been delivered to me. Wait a minute. Hold on. Did man have the authority? Man had the authority, right? But what happened? Okay, so come back up here, Adam. Adam had the authority. Okay. Come here, Eve. Come here, Eve. Eve is there. Okay. This, um, just for illustration purposes only. Can I use you, Luke? Yeah. Can you? He's going to be the enemy. Uh, <laughs> okay, come on. Okay, hold this. Now, Adam had the authority. Eve was talking to the snake. Eve began to believe what the snake told her. And then she took of the fruit and she gave to her husband with her and he did eat. Now, go back to her. Why? Somebody answer this question. Or maybe you, you've thought about this. Why didn't God go over here to Eve and go, don't eat that? <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? Now, if God is in control, he had every right. He had every right. Come on, come on. He had every right to say, don't eat that. Why? Because I know what this will do. If you eat this, this is going to send you, and this is going to put all of mankind in, into condemnation. But why couldn't he do that? Why did he, why did he sit back and watch his man and his woman listen to the devil and eat of a fruit that he know that they weren't supposed to eat of? Because he didn't have the authority to do it. 
It should have been Adam who said, honey, don't eat that. But the moment she ate and gave to her husband with her, he wasn't often Galveston surfing. The moment he did that, the authority with his free will was given over to the enemy. And God couldn't stop it. So now God needs some kind of access into this earth because he's just mankind has just given the devil all of the authority. And see, the devil is like, you can put me on my belly. You can do whatever you want, God. I got the keys. I, I, this is what I came for. This is what I want. So now we go back to Luke chapter four. Thank you. all Y'all give him a hand clap. So now we go back to Luke chapter four. In verse 5, and he says, so the devil took him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment time. And the devil said to him, all this authority now, I will give you. And their glory. For this has been what? Delivered to me. And I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, verse 7, if you will, watch this word, worship me. Worship me. Now, what are we talking about? Radical gratitude. So the devil is after your worship. The devil is after your praise. Now, let's talk about worship for just a minute because we have to understand why are we still in the dilemma that we're in? Why are we still in the the situation that we're in? Because you got to understand, when Jesus came back, Come here, Jesus. He turned from Adam to Jesus. So when Jesus came, Jesus gave the keys back to not just mankind. Jesus gave the keys to the church. Because a man, mankind was still under the influence of the devil. But once you got born again, now you're under the influence of God and you are trusted now with the authority. That's why God says in, Luke, uh, in, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 18, he says, behold, I give you the keys, come on, to the kingdom. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Come on. Yeah. So who has the authority now? The church has the authority. So why is the church still sick? Why is the church still broke? Why is the church still depressed? It's because we have the authority, but we don't know how to use the authority. We have it, but we don't know how to use it. Let me show you how to use it. Thank you, sir. Worship. What is worship? Worship, let's think about this. Worship makes something bigger than it really is. And worship gives strength to something. Now, I know my time is almost up, so can everybody just kind of engage for just a minute? Because this is really good. I'm going to help you get out of your situation. Okay? Y'all just let me. Worship makes something bigger than what it really is. Why does the Bible say, come and magnify the Lord with me? Do you know what magnification does? Magnification makes something bigger. Even though the object itself doesn't change size, you just make it bigger to you. So when I pull up a magnifying glass on something, it may not change in the the size of the thing. But when I put the magnifying glass on, it gets bigger to me. So when I worship, I make something bigger than what it really is. When I worship, watch this, I give something strength. When I worship, I give something power. I give it exaltation. Mm. So the, so To worship the devil during the middle of your circumstance would be to complain, to murmur, to blame. See, we don't want to talk about blame. You know, when we first got saved, I was excited because, you, you know, 
They said, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't chew, you don't run with those that do. Okay, those are all of the outward things that change it. But they don't talk about don't be in strife. Right. Don't gossip. Come on. Don't hate on your neighbor. Come on. See, those are the things that we don't really, oh, well, Pastor, we don't really talk about that. Yeah. You know, I, I still want to hold my right to complain. I still want to hold my right to blame. Well, listen, if you blame and you complain, that's no different than giving worship or strength to the devil to keep you in the circumstance. Glory be to God. So watch this. When you complain, you make the circumstance bigger than your God. But when I praise, I make my God bigger than the circumstance. And when I praise God, I release his supernatural ability out of my spirit. And I authorize him now to work on my behalf. Did y'all catch that? When I praise, I release a force out of my spirit. And now I authorize God to work on my behalf. When I praise... I release a force out of my spirit and I not authorize God to work on my behalf. Well, can't God just work anytime he wants to? Not until I give him the legal right to do so. Now, think about this. Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas. They were in the darkest. Can I use the word? Stinkiest. <laughs> I almost said stank, but I, I, I got to remember where I am. Darkest, stinkiest place on planet Earth. One of them. And in that place, he had every right to complain. Why? Because he was a believer. He was a Christian. He should not be going through what he was going through. I'm out here preaching the gospel. I'm out here casting out devils. I'm out here loving God. But why am I still in the situation? Why am I stuck? And there's a lot of people in life, they love God, but they're still stuck. They're stuck in their drugs. They're stuck in their alcohol. They're stuck in their pornography. They can't get out of it. They love God. Come on, I'm preaching to somebody in here. They love God, but they don't know how to get unstuck. But what did they do? They didn't complain about the jail. They didn't complain about why God did you keep me in here so long. What did they do? They begin to lift their hands. They begin to praise God in the midst of their darkness. And the Bible says that God began to move on the earth. There was an earthquake that began to shake the very foundations of the earth. And every man's bands were loosed. And to the point where the jailer was about to take a knife and run it in himself because he thought everybody had escaped. But nobody escaped. Why? That supernatural force that came out of their praise held everybody in in their place. I'm preaching so good it got me sweating right now. Y'all catch what I'm saying? All right, listen to what I'm saying. Where did that earthquake come from? Out of their praise, but where? Think about it. A lot of times we think the moment we praise, God is just somehow supernaturally going to fall down on us and make something good happen. Pastor Jack, that's not how it happens. Where did the earthquake come from? The earthquake came from within them. It came out of their spirit. The Bible says that Jesus is in our spirit. So anything that happens in the earth doesn't necessarily happen to us, but it comes through us. 
And so when they begin to praise God, when they begin to lift their hands, when they begin to worship in the midst of their circumstance, a supernatural force was released out of them and it caused the whole earth to begin to shake because of the power that was on their lives. See, we get so quiet when we're going through things. Or we begin to complain about the circumstance. And the reason why we complain is because we're stuck in that bit of complaining. We can't find ourselves out of the complaint. Now, do you remember when the Bible says Jehoshaphat? In 2 Chronicles, they begin to go into battle. But God says, don't go in with the army. Go in with the praisers. What did the praisers do? They started praising and they said, for the Lord is good. His mercy endured forever. That praise caused those men to begin to set ambushments against themselves. See, I'm telling you, the enemy will get so confused in your praise. They're going to try to figure out why you're so happy in the midst of your storm. Why are you so thankful in the midst of your of your circumstance? It's because that praise is releasing a supernatural force in your life and it's turning things around for you. I'm, can I get about five? people to begin to praise the Lord and begin to give him praise over the goodness of his life. Why? Because when you do that, when you do that, you turn your circumstance. You've been wanting God to come in there and flip your switch. I'm telling you how to flip your switch. Just begin to praise God in the midst of your storm. One last point. When, when Moses was at the battle, as long as his hands were raised, they were victorious. But the moment his hands went down, they began to get defeated. So God sent two anointed men They didn't raise their hands. They helped raise Moses' hands. Why? Because the one who's in authority has the right to release the praise. And the moment his hands went back up and he had two people on the side of him helping raise his hand, then they were victorious in the battle. See, God is about to send you two crazy friends that's going to not complain with you, not strain with you, not bellyache with you, not cry with you, but they're going to help lift your hands and they're going to say, no, we're going to win this battle. We got this thing. Don't you sit up here and cry and, and, and bawl and squall about your circumstance and your situation. Just lift your hands and begin to worship God. And the, as, as long as your hands are worship, that's when you're going to win the battle. Glory be to God. Praise God. One more point. One more point. Go to Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Everybody say, Praise the Lord. For he's good. And his mercy endures forever. Say it again. Praise the Lord. For he's good. His mercy endures forever. See, this is the place that you can perfect praise. Because if you don't defeat the devil in private, he will embarrass you in public. You got to learn how to praise in your private time. Well, God sends you. My my time is up. Wait, y'all want me to keep going? Okay. Okay. All right, your pastor say keep going, so I can I guess I can keep going. Okay. If you learn how to praise in the private time, God will exalt you in public. 
So why does God build a church like West Houston Christian Center? Why does God have praise and worshipers on the stage? Why does God anoint men and women to play instruments? So you can practice how to praise. A lot of times we come in here and, and we don't care about praising because we're so busy trying to figure out who's winning the Texans or the Cowboys. And it's ironic to me that they would put something like pig worship. Oh, don't get mad at me because I'm talking about your football team. They would put pig worship on the same day that they would put God's worship. Why? The devil's after your worship. And he can manipulate the circumstances because if your team is winning, then you're happy. But if your team is losing, then you're you sad. And if I'm sad and I'm depressed and I'm condemned and I'm complaining, guess what? I now give him authority to move in my life. Hallelujah. Come on. Your pastors are here to teach you how to praise. Amen. Because praise will steal the avenger. Amen. Praise will paralyze the enemy in your life. And I came by, like they do in them old churches, I came by to tell you <laughs> that if you don't learn how to praise, then you will never come out of your circumstance. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, very quickly. Why should we praise in all circumstances? This is Joseph talking. Does anyone know the story of Joseph? Joseph went from the pit to the palace. But along the way, he had plenty of opportunity to be upset, to complain, to blame God for why he went through what he went through. Because I don't know if you remember, he just told a simple dream to his family. And see, sometimes you're going to be in circumstances and situations where people just don't understand you. You are too much fish for your tank. That's right. <laughs> I don't understand why my family don't invite me to family reunions. It's probably because every time you come there, you remind them of their sin. And it's not like you preaching to them and tell, you're calling them a sinner. It's just your righteous light. It's that righteous nature that you have on, on the inside of you that everywhere you go, demons begin to flee and they begin to run because you're there. See, you are the light in the midst of darkness. Amen. So Joseph began to tell a story and everybody got upset. And then they took him and they, you know, and wanted to kill him and the one brother said, no, don't kill him. And they threw him in the pit and there were snakes in the pit. And Joseph had a reason to complain, but he didn't. And then they took him out of the pit and, and a, a band of Ishmaelite uh, 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 traders came and found Joseph, took him out of the pit and they put him in slavery. He had a reason to complain. And if that's not enough, while he was in slavery, um, uh, Potiphar's wife put a sexual harassment lawsuit on him and threw him in jail. But he, but he still did not complain. Amen. He went from jail to talking to a couple of men that were in the palace. And he said, listen, when you go back to the king, don't forget about me. Right. And they forgot about him for two years. He had a reason to complain. Now, every one of, uh, of us in here can say, Joseph, by right, should have complained. <laughs> Joseph, by right, had a reason to be upset with God. Yes, he did. But Joseph knew that God was on his side as long as he kept his heart right and a praise in his mouth. Right. Say that. And the Bible says in verse 20 of Genesis chapter 50, once his brothers came, and said, Joseph, we're sorry. I apologize. I did not know that you was going to be the next man in charge. Please don't do to us what we did to you. Wow. See, what blame and complaining and bitterness will do is it will cause you to look at that one that hurt you and make you want to hurt them. Come on, that. So good. 
But when you're in an attitude of praise, you can have a heart of love and you can begin to praise God even in the midst of your loved ones despising you and persecuting you. And he says this, but as for you, you meant evil against me. You tried to crush me. You tried to destroy me. You tried to take me out. But God meant it for good. See, people are trying to crush you right now. Your life, your past, your circumstances, they're trying to take you out. But whatever the devil meant for evil, God is going to turn it around for your good. His weapon against you is, be- is going to become your weapon against him. All you got to do is just begin to praise God in the middle of your circumstance. What they meant to be a stumbling block is going to be a stepping stone to your destiny. And this is my last point. There's a football player by the name of Jameis Winston. Jameis Winston was a, did he win the Heisman? I can't remember if he won the Heisman. Anyway, he was a first round draft pick. Went to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and got into pros and had a horrible season. Just started, you know, he just wasn't playing that well. And they benched him. Now, he could have gotten high-minded. He could have said, I'm the number one draft pick. I should be playing in this football game. Why? How dare you bench me? How dare you put me down? But when he had an interview, they said to him, what do you feel about being benched? How do you feel about sitting on the bench? He said, it's okay. It's just a minor setback. For a major comeback. And some of you, you've only had a minor setback. Losing that job was just a minor setback. That divorce was just a minor setback. That, that, that loved one that went home too soon was a minor setback. All of the things that you've been going through, those doctor's reports were a minor setback. But God is just setting you up for a major comeback. So if you believe that you're about to have your comeback, stand to your feet, begin to give God a praise, begin to give him a worship for he's worthy of it. Oh, come on, church. Hallelujah. 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 Praise you, God. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. We bless you, Lord. We give you praise. Now, what what are you doing? What are you doing when you praise God? You're not authorizing God to work on your behalf. You're releasing supernatural forces in your life. Get ready for the miracles. Get ready for the breakthroughs. Get ready for the anointing. Get ready for the power. Why? Because you just lifted your hands and gave him a praise. Can I tell you a secret? I'm going to sit down. The secret is The enemy don't want you to know the praise does. And that's why he wants you to keep your mouth shut. And and some of us are so dignified that we can't praise. But we say dignified and broke. We say dignified and sick. We say dignified and in our circumstance. But sometimes you're going to have to just kick off the pants like David did and throw up the shirt and just begin to give God a praise so good that you embarrass your neighbor. All right. One last thing. Pastor Jack, you and uh, Pastor Michelle, just one one minute. Can y'all come up here? First Corinthians chapter 
chapter 12. Verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have, all, have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Verse 15, if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, you are the eye. I am not of the body, is it therefore of not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now God has set the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him, as it has pleased him, as it has pleased him. God put you here because it pleased him. Amen. So if God brought you here, you don't have the right to leave here until he tells you to leave here. Amen. Come on. And if they were one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet one body? And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. So in other words, just as much as you need your pastors, they need you. Amen. That's right. And they need you to be one body. That's a good word. So I release on you a supernatural force Amen. of vision that the eyes will see and the ears will hear. And I declare and decree that God is sending many hands and many feet. That you're going to look up and you're going to see increase. Increase, increase, increase. Just stay the course. Stay in love. Keep a praise on your heart. Even when you come in and you don't see a lot of people here, don't stop praising God. Amen. Praise God for who you have. Amen. Praise God for who showed up. Amen. And as you begin to praise, you release a supernatural force out of your heart that's going to bring in thousands upon thousands. Amen. There are many that are called to this church and they need your vision to bring it to pass. Hallelujah. I call in millionaires. I call in the affluent. I call in the rich. I call in the poor. I call in the downtrodden. I call in the prostitute. I call in the drug addict. I call in the drug dealer. I call in the, I call in the one that was in the mafia. I call in the gangbanger. I call in the one that was sold into sex trafficking. I call them all in because you have the anointing to set them free. So praise the Lord for he's good to you and he's releasing upon you a new anointing, a fresh oil is coming on your life right now in Hallelujah. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.